Whispers in Jonah, Chapter 12 Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Have you any right to be angry? Jonah went out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter and sat in its shade and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a vine and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the vine. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm, which chewed the vine so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, It would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you have a right to be angry about the vine? I do, he said. I am angry enough to die. That's Jonah 4, 3 through 11. I must say, I could not read the final passage without noting how extremely patient God was with Jonah, who was complaining to him, the creator of the universe, and repeating the mantra, I want to die. Three times in nine verses, he says this to the Lord. Why was Jonah so upset? Because he didn't see the justice that he thought was warranted. Jonah was only concerned with his own wants and desires. So often, reading the scriptures is like looking in a mirror, isn't it? Jonah's temperament, his natural human nature, was exposed when God didn't act as Jonah thought he should. Jonah's reaction to the massive repentance of the city of Nineveh is not joy, but anger and self-pity. I can imagine him stomping out of the city in disgust, mumbling in displeasure to himself. These people, if you could call them that, these Ninevites, they weren't worthy of God's forgiveness. They were evil to the core. Everyone knew it. What could God be thinking? Jonah pouted that he would rather die than watch this scene of repentance unfolding before him. His life meant nothing. His work was of no account. But God is not surprised by Jonah's pity party. He knows Jonah inside and out. And he has another lesson to teach him. God asked Jonah, Have you any right to be angry? The implied answer to this question is obviously no. Jonah should be grateful God had used him to turn hearts from sin to repentance. Even the angels rejoice over a single sinner who repents, we're told in Luke 15.10. What was Jonah's response? He chose a place east of the city, probably on a hill so he could have a good vantage point. He built a makeshift shelter, sat down to wait and see what would happen to Nineveh. Evidently, he was still holding out hope that God would destroy this undeserving mass of humanity. What do you suppose he saw as he watched and listened? Remember, the king himself had had decreed that no one in the kingdom be allowed to eat or drink. Ancient customs in the Middle East were very vocal, tending to be loud, I believe. The sounds of a lot of loud wails and crying probably carried on the wind up to Jonah's ears as the people moaned and lamented their sins. They weren't worried about being quiet in expressing their grief and concern over their impending doom. What about the small children and infants? Were they denied food as well? And let's not forget the animals who were hungry and thirsty. No doubt there were a lot of animals loudly complaining as well, for they didn't understand either. The Ninevites had been given a sentence of doom, and they were serious about seeking a reprieve. They were all in. We see Jonah sitting on the hillside in his little makeshift shelter where he, quote, waited to see what would happen, end quote. God was not going to let Jonah sulk in peace. He had a lesson to teach this wayward child. 
Then the Lord God provided a vine and made it grow. Very fast, I guess, to shade Jonah and give him comfort. Jonah was very happy about the vine. Did he consciously recognize that this vine was a miracle from God? Where there was none, all of a the sudden there it was. And, and it was big enough to shade him? Then as Jonah slept, God provided a worm. And at dawn, Jonah's shady vine was chewed by the worm, and it withered and died. The hot sun rose high in the sky, and Jonah missed the shade of that vine. Next, it says, God provided a scorching east wind. With the shade of the leafy vine gone, Jonah grew faint and again expressed his desire to die. What do you think about Jonah's reaction to losing his shade? How does it make him look like a bad-tempered, self-righteous, ungrateful man to me and spoiled? He throws a flat-out pity party, doesn't he? Another good question I wish to the answer that I wish I knew the answer to. Did God require Jonah to stay at Nineveh for a certain length of time? Or could he have gone home after walking throughout the city and making his proclamation of doom? Was he suffering because of his own stubbornness and selfish desire to see the Ninevites perish? And talking about complaining, let's turn the spotlight on you and me. Have we ever complained to God about his provision for us? Ever wondered why he would provide something that wasn't what we wanted, wasn't comfortable, or didn't make us happy? It seems odd to read that God provided these things for Jonah when they included a worm that took away his small comfort, right? It is proof that God's ways are not ours, and his purposes for us are higher than for us to be comfortable. This seems especially true in the United States, where many think that the highest goal is for us to be happy and at ease. That is what our media pushes constantly. You only live once. Grab all the gusto you can get. You deserve a break today. And so on. However, this is not a biblical concept at all. There are many preachers that tell us God wants us all healthy, wealthy, and wise. What does that say for the vast majority of us who are none of those things? In fact, John 16.33 tells us the exact opposite. It says, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on the earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. What about the Apostle Paul who prayed three times that a severe trial be taken away from him? What was God's reply to him? Paul himself tells us, quote, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. That's found in 2 Corinthians twelve nine. God questions Jonah a second time. Do you have a right to be angry about the vine? Jonah was quick with his answer. I do, and I am angry enough to die. God answered and pointed out the selfishness of Jonah's logic. He said, you have been more concerned for your own comfort, been angry at a worm for disturbing your comfort. All the while waiting to see me destroy 120,000 people and many cattle. Jonah, you can't see the need of anyone but yourself. God seems to have been implying a lot with his statement to Jonah. He seems to be saying, You selfishly want me to bless only you and your people, while letting those who haven't had the blessing of being led by me through the wilderness, haven't been delivered miraculously from Egypt, haven't been fed daily from heaven with manna so they didn't starve, haven't had quail blown in from the east to add variety to their diet, and haven't benefited from the teaching of Yahweh passed down from generation to generation. Yet here you sit, 
waiting for me to smite these who haven't known me before? Those who, when they were confronted with their sin, they immediately repented. Should I not be concerned about that great city? This question rings down through the centuries to us. Who is worthy of God's forgiveness? Certainly not our country in the moral and spiritual condition we are in. Not we in our perceived self-righteousness. What about those whom we find it hard to forgive? Are we better than they are? Yes, actions have consequences and evil will be judged But what if God chooses to grant repentance to some of them? Jonah did not live to see Nineveh fall. It was over 125 years later in 612 BCE that the Medo-Babylonians rebelled against Assyria and conquered their capital of Nineveh. There was a prophecy after Jonah's time against Nineveh in Zephaniah 2, 13 and 15. Quote, and the Lord will strike the lands of the north with his fist, destroying the land of Assyria. He will make its great capital, Nineveh, a desolate wasteland, parched like a desert. This is the boisterous city, once so secure, saying, I am the greatest, it boasted. But now look how it has become an utter ruin. End quote. Evidently, whatever repentance took place in Jonah's time had deteriorated through the six generations after. Sadly, this is the way of humanity. Our hope and belief is that someday God will make all things new again forever. Lord, we see through the glass darkly at this time. Our eyes are clouded with personal desires and hurts and anger. We see only three-dimensionally, but you, O Lord, are above all, and all is in you. One day we will see with your eyes. One day evil will be judged, and the earth will again be free. Until then, grant us compassion and love to a lost and deceived and hurting world. Even so, Lord Jesus, come. Amen.